Let's start off at number 10 now with the dodo. The dodo is one of the most famous extinct animals of all time, responsible for coining the phrase as dead as a dodo. The last of these birds was thought to have died out in 1662. They were only found on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. They lived in harmony with the ecosystem there and had no natural predators until humans arrived and killed them off for food. Scientists discussed the possibility of bringing back the dodo from extinction during a TEDx discussion in Washington DC in 2013. The dodo's closest living relative is the Nicobar pigeon and some say that one of its eggs could be fused with the cell of a dodo to create a living dodo. Imagine if that happened, it would ruin that phrase. Next up at number 9 now we have the mammoth. Now this is perhaps the most famous extinct animal of all time. Society has been obsessed with these woolly elephant cousins for decades. Interesting fact for you guys, although most of them did die out about 10,000 years ago, a small population of mammoths survived on Wrangel Island off the coast of Russia until just 3,600 years ago. That's nothing if you think about it. Humans were running around at the end of the Bronze Age during then. Anyway, because of how recently they died out and how many of their bodies became frozen in the permafrost, scientists have actually been able to extract cells from mammoth remains. The plan is then to splice specific mammoth genes into the genome of an elephant embryo to create a sort of mammoth elephant hybrid with all the mammoth traits we recognize. Now this isn't just for no reason either. Some scientists say that these new mammoths could help prevent tundra permafrost from melting and releasing huge amounts of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Moving on to number 8 now, we have the thylacine. This species died out in the 1930s after being hunted to extinction in its native Australia. It may look like a dog, but the thylacine actually belonged to the marsupial family and was a relative of kangaroos and koalas. A group of Australian scientists led by Michael Archer have previously worked on bringing back the thylacine from extinction. They called themselves the Lazarus Project. Their efforts only managed to capture some of the fragments of the thylacine DNA though, and not enough for a true clone. Still, even this was enough for people to see the thylacine as a strong candidate for eventual de-extinction. Next up at number 7 now we have the gastric brooding frog. This little frog was native to the eastern coast of Australia and went extinct less than 100 years ago. It got its name from its interesting method of reproduction. The females would swallow their fertilized eggs which would then hatch into tadpoles in the frog's stomach before being vomited out into the water. It sounds gross but it definitely worked. Because of how recently they went extinct, scientists recovered enough genetic material to create create living embryos. They haven't been used to create an actual gastric brooding frog yet, but some argue that even this means they are already back from extinction. Moving on to number 6 now, we have the Bucardo. The Bucardo was a wild goat native to the Pyrenees. The last one, a female named Celia, died in January 2000. Scientists preserved her cells and attempted to bring the species back from the dead. They injected the nuclei from Celia's cells into goat eggs that had been emptied of their DNA. They then implanted 50 seven of them into different goat surrogate mothers of closely related species. Only seven of them became pregnant and six of those had miscarriages. One of the goats successfully gave birth to a clone though. Fernandez Arias held the newborn calf in his arms. He said it was struggling to breathe and all of their attempts to help failed. The calf died just 10 minutes later. It was found to have a faulty lung caused by a genetic defect. At the time it was the closest the world has ever come to de-extinction and still remains a possible candidate. Moving on to number 5 now we have the quagga. The quagga is an extinct subspecies of the plain zebra and lived in South Africa. The last wild quagga was hunted to extinction in 1878. The last captive one died in Amsterdam 5 years later. Now, Because of their close relationship to the plain zebra, some scientists have created the quagga project which is attempting to use selective breeding to create a new subspecies that strongly resembles the quagga. In 2016 the project announced they had 6 individuals individuals showing the preferred pattern. The goal is to have 50 of them and then move them to a protected area for continued breeding. Will this count as the quagga being brought back from extinction? Let me know what you think. Alright moving on to number 4 now we have Stella's sea cow. This sea mammal was discovered by Europeans in 1741 on Bering Island in the northern Pacific Ocean. It went extinct just 27 years later after being hunted for its meat, fat and hide. It belonged to a group of species known as Dugongidae. The only survivor 
surviving species of that group is now the dugong. Some scientists hope that if enough sea cow DNA can be recovered, they can fuse it with the egg of a dugong and bring back the sea cow from extinction. One major problem though is size. Modern dugongs are just a fraction of the size of the extinct sea cow, so the pregnancy would be extremely difficult. Let's just say that. It's a problem that's still being worked on though. Next up at number three now, we have the passenger pigeon. Okay, this one might not be as cool as some of the other animals on our list, but give it a chance. In the 1860s, there were billions of these pigeons across North America. One account said that a flock once passed over southern Ontario that was a mile wide, 300 miles long, and took 14 hours to pass overhead. Less than 50 years later, they were extinct, mainly due to mass hunting. Enough specimens have been preserved so that scientists could reconstruct the birds in entire genome. The plan would then be to fuse this with the egg of the passenger pigeon's closest living relative, the band-tailed pigeon. However, there is no guarantee that the band-tailed pigeon will then tend to the egg or even look after any successful hatchlings. Next up at number two now, we have the auroch. About 10,000 years ago, the prehistoric settlers of India and Eurasia domesticated the auroch, an animal that looks a lot like a cow. That's because all modern day cattle are the descendants of the auroch. The auroch itself went extinct in the wild, but scientists are hoping to bring it back through back breeding cattle. This is where they breed cattle together that resemble the auroch. They then take the calves that most resemble the auroch and breed them, etc, etc, until eventually you get something that looks a lot like an auroch. One example of this that's already happened is heck cattle. Here's some pictures of them now. However, some people have debated whether these even really look like auroch. They're also a lot smaller too. Maybe they will get there one day though. And finally number one now, we have the Carolina parakeet. This bird was hunted to extinction 100 years ago. It was native to the eastern US, which surprised me because its plumage would suggest it was much more tropical. Its feathers were also the reason it went extinct. Many of them were hunted so that the feathers could be used in women's hats, which were fashionable at the time. Some remained as pets or in captivity, but eventually they all died out. Now as with many others on our list, their extinction being quite recent is a reason why they could make a good candidate for de-extinction. Some people worry though that if it was brought back, history would just repeat itself all over again as their feathers would instantly become valuable. Starting us off at number 10, we have the quagga. Once a prolific subspecies of zebra across South Africa, the quagga was sadly hunted to extinction in the 19th century. The decline in population all started after European colonists took to South Africa and hunted the species nearly into the ground as it competed with domesticated animals for forage. By 1878, the wild population was decimated, although some were taken to zoos in Europe in an effort to rehabilitate. But tragically, in the end, the breeding programs were unsuccessful and the last captive quagga died in Amsterdam in 1883. That was until about 100 years later when the quagga became the first extinct animal whose DNA was analyzed and it was then then that scientists discovered just how close a match they were to the plains zebra. By 1987, the Quagga project began and their mission is to recreate the phenotype of hair coat pattern by selectively breeding the genetically closest subspecies, which as we now know is the zebra. The first full of this project was born in 1988 and since its early days, they have seen quite a bit of success. If all goes well, the selectively bred quagga like zebras will be released back into the wild. Coming in at number nine, the Cuban macaw. Prior to the 15th century, these vibrant and colorful birds could be found all over the main island of Cuba. But when Europeans landed, they had other plans for these parrots. Although indigenous populations had hunted the species prior to the colonists invasion, once the Europeans arrived, the amount soared. Many were hunted or traded, while others were sent back off to Europe to live as cage birds and eventually by the late 19th century, between the rampant overhunting and habitat destruction, the very last of the Cuban macaws died, making the species extinct. 
But according to the British writer Errol Fuller, aviculturists are rumored to have bred birds similar in appearance to the Cuban macaw using the genes of a sister species. So who knows, we could be seeing them fly around Cuba in the near future. Coming in at number 8, the Arabian oryx. Historically speaking, the Arabian oryx could have been seen roaming around throughout most of the Middle East. But by the time the late 19th century rolled around, you were not likely to see one outside of Saudi Arabia. And in the 1930s, the only remaining populations were found either in the Nefa Desert in the north or the Rub Akali in the south. Tragically, it only got worse from there. Starting in the 1930s, it became fairly customary for Arabian princes and oil companies to hunt down the animal and eventually the hunts grew to employ as many as 300 vehicles at once. By the middle of the 20th century, the northern population was effectively extinct and finally the last Arabian oryx died in 1972. Thankfully, a few people had the forethought to send a couple off into captivity and they were effectively reintroduced into the wild a few years later. That being said, they are still an endangered animal, but interestingly, it is the first animal to revert to a vulnerable species after being declared extinct. So it's definitely getting better. Coming in at number 7, Caspian Tigers. During their prime, Caspian Tigers could be found in Turkey and through much of Central Asia, including Iran, Iraq, and northwestern China. But with the Russian colonization of Turkestan during the late 19th century, their population began to be threatened. The first problem was obviously that the tigers were being hunted by large parties of sportsmen or military personnel. Until the early 20th century, the army was used to clear predators from forests around settlements and potential agricultural lands. In fact, until World War I, about 50 tigers were killed in the forests each year. By the 50s, they became an officially protected species, but even so, by the 1970s, the last remaining Caspian tigers were gone. However, according to recent findings that the Siberian tiger is the closest relative to the Caspian tiger, discussions have been started about introducing the Siberian tiger into a safe space in Central Asia. And hopefully, if they get it right, the tiger would adapt and live successfully where the Caspian tiger once roamed. Coming in at number 6, Heath Hens. Once an extremely common bird, heath hens were a subspecies of prairie chicken that could have been found just about anywhere across North America in colonial times. However, like many other species, the population was deeply affected by colonizers who hunted them extensively for food. In fact, it has been speculated that at the first Thanksgiving, it was actually heath hens that were served, not wild turkey. However, by the time the 18th century, rolled around, the heath hens developed a reputation as being the poor man's food, as it was cheap and plentiful. And as the hunting continued to soar, the heath hens became more and more of a distant memory. By the 1870s, the animal was virtually extinct from the mainland, with only a few hundred left on Martha's Vineyard, until eventually the late 19th century put a hunting ban in to try and keep the species alive after an estimated 70 remained. This worked for a while, but due to a myriad of problems, the last remaining heath hen died in 1932. But there is still hope for them to return. As they are closely related to the prairie chicken, scientists have started researching projects aiming at the de-extinction of the animal using DNA from preserved cells as a basis for restructuring the DNA of greater prairie chickens. So with any luck, heath hens could be roaming around soon again. Coming in at number 5, Oryx. Considered to be the wild ancestor of modern domestic cattle, oryx were a species of large cattle that once lived in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. And when I say large, I mean large. Apparently oryx could reach a height of 6.6 .6 feet at the shoulder and weigh up to 3,000 pounds. However, due to hunting and habitation loss, the oryx became extinct when the last individual died in 1627. 
7. However, recreating the extinct species may not be an out of this world thought according to scientists. Starting back in the 1920s, Heinz Heck, a German biologist, initiated a selective breeding program where he attempted to breed back the oryx using several cattle breeds. Essentially, the idea was to breed out what they had been domesticated for, and the result was called Heck cattle. By the 1980s, herds of Heck cattle were released into the Netherlands, and since, Heck cattle have been crossbred with other European cattle breeds in the hopes of creating a more orcs-like cow. Coming in at number 4. The dodo. Maybe the most recognizable of any extinct species due to just how straight up bananas this bird looked was the dodo. Once upon a time, it was found exclusively on the island of Mauritius, but what was most fascinating about the dodo was that it evolved without any natural predators. However, like many animals that evolved in isolation, the dodo was entirely fearless of humans. However, this fearlessness, coupled with its inability to fly, unfortunately made the dodo an all too easy target for sailors. Although contrary to popular belief, it wasn't just hunting that took out the dodos, but the introduction of other animals like monkeys and pigs into their habitat who destroyed their nests and forced them into a competition for limited resources as well. So have these cartoon looking birds actually been brought back? since their 17th century extinction? To be honest, not technically. But scientists are trying. Beth Shapiro, a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, said that she has completed fully sequencing the dodo's genome from an ancient DNA based on genetic material extracted from dodo remains. And the next steps are in the works. Next up at number 3, the Tasmanian Tiger. The Tasmanian Tiger was once a carnivorous marsupial native to the Australian mainland as well as the islands of Tasmania and New Guinea. But beginning in the 19th century, they were perceived as a threat to the livestock of farmers, so overhunting was eventually the largest factor in their demise. Sadly, the last of the Tasmanian Tigers was illegally captured in 1936 by Elias Churchill and sold off to a zoo where she stayed until her death. But a return of the Tasmanian tiger could very well happen in our lifetime. In 1999, the Australian Museum began a cloning project for the animal, an endeavour that was initially dismissed as a publicity stunt. But in 2002, researchers successfully extracted replicable DNA from the specimens. Now, Fast forward to August of last year, and the University of Melbourne announced it will be partnering with a company called Colossal Biosciences to attempt to recreate the animal animal using its closest living relative and return it to Tasmania. Coming in at number 2, the woolly mammoth. I'm sure we're all familiar with the gigantic fuzzy ancestor to the elephant because, well, it's probably one of the most famous extinct species recorded. The last isolated population of woolly mammoths lived on Wrangell Island in the Arctic Ocean until roughly 4,000 years ago, and famously the first actual remains of the behemoth were found in Siberia in the late 18th century. Interestingly, at first, the researchers studying them were incredibly confused because they could not understand how a warm climate animal such as an elephant could have wound up in such a freezing cold area. But eventually, they put all the pieces together and came to the realization that what they had found were the remains of an extinct animal. Amazingly, since those first few skeptical years, thanks to the cold temperatures in the Arctic, the carcasses of the extinct creature have been super well preserved by ice allowing scientists to access the DNA in ways that is not always possible. And thanks to that, it is apparently in the works to try and bring the beasts back into the world. In fact, after a genome project for the mammoth was completed in 2015, it has been proposed the species could be revived through various means. So while it hasn't happened just yet, by the sounds of it, it could be any day now. And last up in our number one spot, the Pyrenean Ibex. While there are many genetic testings in the works along with breeding of similarly extinct species with the hopes of adaptation, if we are talking about an actually extinct animal that has been successfully brought back to life, then the Pyrenean Ibex is in a league of its own. During its prime, it was often found in areas like France, Portugal, Spain, and Andorra. However, starting in the late 19th century, their population began to 
dwindle until eventually the Pyrenean ibex was officially declared extinct in 2000. But the amazing thing about this animal is that unlike any of the others on this list, Three years after the last one died, scientists used its frozen cells to clone a calf, making it the first and only animal to have a living specimen exist post extinction. Now, the caveat is that sadly the clone did not survive long after birth. It actually died a few minutes later due to a lung defect. But it did prove that it could be possible to actually bring a species back from the dead. Okay, starting off at number 10, like we always do, we have the Megatherium. This animal is also known as the giant ground sloth, and they were one of the largest terrestrial animals that ever lived on this planet. They measured in at about 20 feet in length, but they were slow moving herbivore so animals didn't really fear this creature. Early humans in South America hunted this massive creature and they hunted it to its extinction 10,000 years ago or did they? In the deep jungle of South America there are so many tales about terrifying creatures who stands at 10 feet tall. They have enormous backward facing claws and thick brown fur. All of these characteristics are consistent with the Megatherium's description so maybe these aren't just stories. Next up number 9 we have the Mastodon. These hairy creatures are prehistoric relatives of the modern elephant. Mastodons have tusks, floppy ears and a long nose which is very similar to the elephant. Mastodons appeared on earth about 27 million to about 30 million years ago, primarily in North and Central America. They typically stayed in the woodlands areas or sometimes around valleys and swamps. They apparently went extinct about 10,000 years ago and most of the theories say that they went extinct because a lot of the scientists believe that the earth warmed up too quickly from the ice age for the Mastodon to adapt to or that humans hunted them to extinction. So although they went extinct so long ago, a man named David Ingram described seeing creatures twice the size of a horse, hairy and in the shape of an elephant. He accurately described what a mastodon would look like and he said he saw them while he was traveling to the United States. There are even other people claiming to have spot these creatures in modern times. Next up number 8 we have the Japanese wolf. Japan used to have two species of wolf that used to live on islands. Biologists consider the Japanese wolf to be extinct, however, there are a ton of rumors circulating of people seeing them in the wild regions of Japan. These two wolf species became extinct in the late 1800s and the early 1900s due to rabies, loss of habitat and hunting by humans. Despite their extinction, a Japanese wolf was sighted in 1910 and then in the 1930s and then again in the 1950s. If that wasn't enough to convince you that these creatures are still alive today, there have been a ton of sightings in the 1900s. Skeptics believe the humans are mistaking a hybrid wolf dog for the Japanese wolf. That's definitely a possibility, but what if the Japanese wolf was still alive today? Pouncing in at number 7 we have the Javan Tiger. They are a relatively small tiger that is as tall as a Great Dane. On the island of Java in Indonesia, this was the home of the Javan Tiger, but as humans occupied more and more of the island, the Javan Tiger was forced to move to the uninhabitable parts of the island. They were hunted by the humans so they could make more room for farming and unfortunately by the time the government stepped in to preserve their species, the tiger was already too far gone. However, many locals have spotted Javan tiger claw marks and footprints and they could still be alive because they are excellent at hiding and avoiding humans. Also in 1995, a Javan forester discovered a large group of these tigers still living on the island. These sightings continued into the early 2000s and people are still finding evidence that the species still exists today. Swimming into our number 6 spot on our list, we're talking about the Plesios. Saurus. This is apparently an extinct marine reptile who lived approximately 135 years ago in the Jurassic period. They have long necks, thin bodies, wide flippers, and small heads. They have very sharp teeth and incredibly strong jaws, so they're able to feed on any fish that came in their path. Creatures matching this description have been spotted all over the world in lakes and in oceans. A lot of people believe that this animal
animal exists and people are just calling it the Loch Ness Monster. It is actually possible that these animals survived and they're just living in the depths of the ocean where humans are unable to explore. If this plesiosaurus still exists today, that would also explain why people have reported seeing sea dragons from around the world. The Tasmanian tiger leaps onto this list at number 5. This species is also known as a thylacin and they were a timid and a nocturnal creature who was considered to be a major pest and a dangerous threat to livestock. They look similar to a medium or large dog, except they had a stiff tail and an abnormal pouch, kind of like a kangaroo. The government set up a bounty system between 1888 and 1909 in order to get rid of these species. So people went all over Australia killing the Tasmanian tiger, and they officially went extinct in 1936. Or did they? Since its extinction, there have been many sightings of the Tasmanian tiger in Tasmania and Australia. It has been spotted so many times times that a lot of people really believe that the Tasmanian tiger still exists today. Here's a clip that was taken in 1973 proving that these animals might still be alive. Take a look at this. Marching in at number 4, the woolly mammoth. This would be amazing to see this alive today. These creatures were closely related to the Asian elephants. Woolly mammoths look a lot like them except for a couple major differences. They were covered with a thick coat of brown hair to keep them warm in the frigid weather. Even though the woolly mammoth went extinct around 10,000 years ago, we have a lot of information about them because of the permafrost in the Arctic preserved their bodies and left them in almost perfect condition. But what if I told you that these giant creatures might still be roaming the earth. There are a lot of people who have claimed that they saw a woolly mammoth in the modern times. In the late 1940s, frozen mammoths were discovered with fresh meat still in their mouths, and every once in a while there are stories all over the internet of people claiming that they've seen an elephant creature with thick fur. Take a look at this video I have for you guys. Okay, so a man filmed what appears to be a woolly mammoth in Siberia. So what do you guys think? Did a woolly mammoth go extinct 4,000 years ago, or could they still be alive today? The Beijing Dolphin comes onto our list at number three. The Beijing Dolphin, or the Chinese River Dolphin, is the first dolphin to be declared extinct in modern times. This is just incredibly sad. It is the first large mammal species in 50 years to have gone extinct, and it was solely due to mankind. This animal was declared extinct in December 2006 due to harmful fishing practices such as the use of gill nets, rolling hooks, or electrical stunning. There were efforts put in place to save this species but none of them apparently worked. But even though there are thought to be extinct, a beige was spotted in 2007 by a team of researchers. Unfortunately, there was only that one sighting since the extinction, but it's still possible that these dolphins might still be alive today. Stepping into this list at number two, we have the mysterious Bigfoot. Other otherwise known as the Gigantopithecus. Their fossils indicate that they were the largest known primates that ever lived. They stood at a height of 3 meters or about 9.8 feet and they weighed as much as 540 to 600 kilograms which is about 1320 pounds. I mean damn. Now these are one creatures I don't know if I want to be alive today because they're pretty terrifying. However scientists almost knows nothing about this mysterious ape. The first piece of evidence that this ape existed, it was discovered by a German paleontologist who found a large molar. Okay, so get this, it was dubbed as a dragon tooth. For years, this was the only trace of this ape, but since then, researchers have found dozens of teeth and a few partial jaws of the Gigantopithecus. It is believed that this giant creature went extinct because the forest shrank and they weren't able to find enough food to survive and reproduce. But some people believe that the Gigantopithecus survived and evolved into Bigfoot. The two creatures look very similar and there have been many people reporting that they have seen this mysterious creature. Okay, so topping this list, in at number one, we have the mighty Megalodon. This species of shark was the largest to have ever lived. Paleontologists believe that the Megalodon was capable of growing up to at least 52 feet, which is three times as long as the longest great white shark ever. No one knows for sure what the Megalodon looked like because all 
all that remains from the prehistoric monster are some teeth and a few vertebrae, but paleontologists are able to make a very educated guess. Originally, the Megalodon was believed to be wiped out by global warming. However, there have been many sightings all over the world by fishermen and sailors who have claimed to see this large shark. That couldn't be the great white shark because it was way too big. There was also a fossil of the Megalodon tooth found deep in the ocean, which means that they still might be living in the deep sea and occasionally they come up to the surface. I mean, after all, there's still 95% of the world's ocean that still hasn't been explored, which is insane to me. All I know for sure is that I would never want to have an encounter with these beasts. Imagine surfing and then bam, the Megalodon is right there behind you. Yeah, your lunch. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Stellar Sea Cow. Stellar indeed. Okay, the Stellar Sea Cow was named after George Wilhelm Stellar, who discovered this massive creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were around over 2.6 million years ago, and they were no match for humans. They only swam about a meter deep, and once humans came into the picture with, you know, hunting and aggression and everything, they were quite easy to hunt. George Stellar commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which in turn made it even easier for us to hunt them. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But this list, we have a little hope now, don't we? Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we could see the creature again one day. Hopefully. The answer may lie right now in the DNA of a dugong. Dugongs are the cow of the sea. You know what, they're great. Let's have all the cows of all seas back immediately. Number nine, passenger pigeons. The passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies. They would fly in flocks so large, it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Isn't that beautiful? It's like some Lion King stuff right there. But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are now no more. So what happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting obviously just eliminated the coolest looking bird out there by far. A little different than the pigeons we have today, that's for sure. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon protected in indigenous lands in Canada, up in Northwest Territories. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeopteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a hint Oh, dinosaur. What could go wrong? Number eight, the woolly mammoth. It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal are planning to bring back, are planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. That's just the thing we need right now in this world. Out of all the problems, we're like, you know what could solve it? The woolly mammoth, for sure. That'll bring jobs back. The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these woolly mammoths, but climate change began to slow them down just a little bit. And humans also needed food, so that surely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and, well, look at them. Obviously, a lot of food. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. Honestly, I hope it works, but then, I mean, now what? All these things are great scientifically, but it's like, and then what? Number seven, the dodo bird. Speaking of the devil, this is, we're definitely gonna eat these guys. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the island of Meritius, located in the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were big gray and blue, and they didn't have any natural predator, which is pretty sweet. They didn't have one until we came along. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and, well, the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either. We're not just 100% here to blame, you know? Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. So yeah, it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but can we bring back the dodo bird? Are we doing it? I think we're gonna do it. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart here. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring this bird back to life. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back an animal. Scientifically, that's a feat in itself, but do we really think nobody's gonna make dodo chicken wings? I'm just saying. That's just a problem waiting to happen. Number six, Pyrenean Ibex. The last Pyrenean Ibex was a female named Celia. A falling tree sadly killed her in 2000. She was a subspecies of the Spanish Ibex and the Pyrenean Ibex were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France, as her name hints towards. Back in the medieval ages though, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. So it wasn't just recently, it was way back, you know, because of, again, 
Hi, we got hungry. They were all over the place and knights and swords and bows and armies to feed. They were hunted down, sadly. Disease spread by humans also played an important role in their demise during this time. The Pyrenean Ibex was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven minutes. So we actually did this one. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Lung complications are why the clone didn't last, but listen to what I just said. They made a clone. Seven minutes is a start. I think I can handle a clone of myself for seven minutes, and then after that, I'm tapping out. Number five, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, it was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s. Major factors here, as you guessed, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. It was sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back. So we're like, ah, oh, but maybe, maybe. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? Specimens still remain preserved in jars. Thank God for those jars. About time we open those things up, right? All those jar guys are like, hmm, finally, pull this one out. Already we have some of the Tasmanian tiger genes present after scientists inserted them into a mouse fetus. The Australian Museum has been working hard to bring this beast back to life. They're only still lacking the DNA to fully recreate it. So if you have any jars of Tasmanian tiger parts, you know, help us out, hit those thumbs. Number four, the great auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would be only used to swim. Had little tiny, little wings. The wings were much smaller, they were about 13 centimeters long, little flappy arms. No wonder they couldn't fly, look at these things, oh my God. They were cute, but obviously they were quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg from Club Penguin, and then we just rolled in and we're like, ho ho ho, we are so hungry. It was packed, so they rapidly declined, and by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Eldi Island, just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs, remember those jars of organs always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA in the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed auk. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, and I'm hoping they pull through. Number three, the MOA. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago. Moa were these flightless birds, massive, might I add, and archeologists first discovered its fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. That's the gross part. These ancient birds would reach about five feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think that's quite petite in comparison. These birds stopped flying right after the dinosaurs went extinct. Interesting timing. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make these daring dino escapes in the sky. They walked around, got fat, and would hang out in caves. Honestly, pretty ideal. Phillips says this is an advantage when it comes to birds and evolution because wings, be it big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating good, they're comfortable now. Scientists have now found more MOA DNA from ancient eggshells, so it's possible that we may see these fatties soar the skies once again. Number two, Megatherium aka giant ground sloths. That's a bit of a nicer name. Yeah, sloths, let's bring those back. Wait, they're already here. Hmm, I'm confused, Taylor. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think. We often look at them now for being so slow and silly. The movie Ice Age or Zootopia, they sure didn't help their case. Now, of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth, but luckily for us, today's sloths aren't that big. They're not the same size as an elephant, which is pretty sweet. That would be a horror film. If a giant elephant-sized sloth started to climb that tree, slowly, might I add, ugh, I'd be sick. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off 8,000 years ago. DNA samples were extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part. That's where science and technology might just do the rest. But as of right now, we just we've got a pile of hair. We're like, maybe. And finally, number one, the gastric brooding frog. I'm a big fan of frogs and toads, all that stuff. Except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. That's arguably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We'll maybe show you after, maybe, I don't know. These gastric brooding frogs would swallow their eggs and then hatch them out of their mouth. So if you watch them give birth in reverse, it would be pretty confusing. That would be a horror film. They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have figured out how to implant these dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Let's just hope these new ones aren't born out of your back. 
Starting off at number 10 now, we have the Megalodon. Megalodon was the biggest shark that ever lived. They went extinct about 2.6 million years ago. Scientists think they could have grown to an insane 60 feet in length. That's about three times as long as the largest great white shark ever found. Here's how big they are. Before modern science identified them as a prehistoric species of shark, people used to think the Megalodon teeth they'd found were actually dragon tongues. Others said they belonged to giant serpents or even that they were rocks that had fallen from the moon. Just think how big and scary you'd have to be for people to think that your teeth belong to dragons or outer space. It used to feed on prehistoric whales, and unlike modern sharks, which go for the soft underbelly of their prey, Megalodon just went for the whole thing. They would bite down on the whale's chest with some 41,000 pounds of force, the strongest ever recorded, and simply crush the whale's chest cavity and organs. They didn't stand a chance, and unless you're an even bigger whale watching this video, you probably wouldn't either. Next up at number 9 now, we have Phobiromis patasone. This was a huge rat. Some scientists have even called it Ratzilla. Technically, it wasn't a rat, but if you're scared of them, I bet you'd be scared of this. They reached a whopping 9.8 feet long. Their tails alone could reach 4.9 feet. They had the weight to go with it too, often reaching over 1,500 pounds. Like most rodents, they had big incisor teeth. In the case of Ratzilla though, their incisor teeth were about a foot long. It's a good job they were herbivores and used those teeth for plant life, however I don't think that knowledge would do much to calm people if they were suddenly seen running around the streets at night. Coming at number 8 now we have the Titanoboa. Everyone with a phobia of snakes, please look away now. This was a massive snake thought to actually be the largest that's ever lived. Its name literally means Titanic Boa. It lived around 60 million years ago. The largest individuals reached up to 42 feet in length and weighed over 2,500 pounds. That's well over a ton for a snake. It could grow this big because the Earth's climate was a lot warmer back then. As the climate began to cool over the next few million years, only smaller snakes could survive and snakes like the Titan Boa began to disappear. Probably a good thing for us humans because we would not want to be running around worrying about snakes that weigh as much as your average rhino. No thanks. Next up at number 7 now we have Dunkleosteus. This is a fish that lived about 370 million years ago during the late Devonian period. These things were big, growing up to 30 feet in length and weighing over a ton. What's most scary about them is their bite. This fish could bite down on its prey with a force of some 6,000 newtons. That might not mean anything to you until I say that's almost about four times the bite strength of a polar bear. This fish could bite your arm clean off you, including the bone. Its jaws were so efficient they could hinge them open and snap them shut in a matter of milliseconds. If we were to bring this species back to life, people might worry about them more than sharks. At number six now, we have the Mega Piranha. Unlike a lot of scientific names on this list, the Mega Piranha has a kind of obvious one. It was a giant piranha fish that lived about 10 million years ago. They grew to around 3 feet long and unlike modern piranhas, they had not one but two separate rows of teeth. Scientists aren't even sure how hard they could bite, but some estimates go as high as 4,749 newtons. If that's the case, they would bite more than twice as hard as a hippo. Neither of those sounds fun, but one definitely sounds worse. Moving on to number 5 now, we have giant Gigantopithecus. In many ways, this creature is what we'd call Bigfoot. It lived between 9 million to 100,000 years ago in Asia and was the largest ape on Earth. They stood about 10 feet tall and their diets were mostly vegetarian. When I say stand, I mean stand in the way gorillas and chimpanzees do. It's thought they walked on all fours. However, a small number of scientists do think they walked on two legs like humans. Either way, with a 12 foot arm span, you'd be best to stay clear of this giant and unpredictable ape. Next up at number 4 now we have Helicoprion. This was a shark like creature that lived some 290 million years ago during the early Permian era. We've seen some very weird creatures on the list so far, but this might just beat them all. The Helicoprion is famous for his spirally arranged clusters of teeth known as tooth walls. This bizarre set of teeth would have reached about 24 inches in length. Moving on to number 3 now we have the short faced bear. The scientific name for these is the Arctodus. They first appeared in the fossil record 1.8 8 million years ago and seemed to survive all the way up until just 11,000 years ago. So, a pretty close call for us modern humans. One specimen found weighed 2,110 pounds. 
They stood up to 12 feet tall on their hind legs, about twice the height of the average human male. Their vertical arm reach extended up to a further 14 feet. I could keep giving you guys stats on just how monstrous these bears were. Between those ones and the pictures you're seeing now, I think you get the idea. They were 50% larger than the biggest polar bears in recorded history. Scientists estimate they needed a whopping 35 pounds of meat a day just to survive. If we brought them back from extinction, I'm sure they wouldn't mind human meat being a part of that. Next up at number 2 now, we have the Meganeura. Dragonflies are nice, right? They're pretty cool looking creatures you find fluttering around ponds and rivers. They're a little bit freaky if they land on you, but you know, hey, at least they're small. Not Meganeura though. This massive dragonfly-like creature lived about 300 million years ago during a Carboniferous period. Its wingspan could reach up to 30 inches, making this thing about the size of a 6 month old baby. Don't ask me why I'm using a baby as a reference, it's just the best comparison I could find. They reached this size because insects need more oxygen the bigger they are. Back then, the oxygen levels in the atmosphere were higher than the current 20% we have today. This allowed insects, including Meganeura, to grow insanely big. You wouldn't need your hand to bat this thing away, more like a baseball bat. And finally at number 1 now we have Dinosuchus. This is an extinct relation of the modern alligator that lived some 80 to 73 million years ago. That means it was alive at the same time as T. rex. In fact, it's thought these two actually fought it out back then. They are thought to have been up to 33 feet in length and have weighed as much as 5 tons. It looks like the T. rex might not have been much of a match for this oversized alligator. There have actually been T. rex fossils found with massive Dinosuchus bites found in them. Perhaps they were just defending their territories from T-Rexes or perhaps they saw them as food. Either way, they definitely were not scared of T-Rexes and so they definitely wouldn't be scared of us. I get the feeling if we brought them back from extinction, that might be where we're heading next. First up at number 10, we have the passenger pigeon. Now these wild birds lived in huge numbers in North America. When Europeans arrived, there was thought to be about 4 billion passenger pigeons on the continent. Now to put that in perspective, there was about 500 million humans humans alive at the time. That meant these pigeons outnumbered humans about 8 to 1. What? They would swarm in the air in groups of about a mile wide and people said it actually took hours for a flock to pass overhead. But they lived in forests that the settlers chopped down for farmland. When they tried to eat the grain from this new farmland, the hunt was on. There were no laws about how many pigeons a farmer could kill and the killing during the 19th century was crazy. It was just a slaughter. By the time conservation laws came in, it was already way too late. Martha, the last passenger pigeon in existence, died in a zoo in 1914. That one is just depressing. Now though for our number 9, it's the Caribbean monk seal. As the name suggests, this monk seal was found in the Caribbean, unlike its relatives that you usually find in much colder climates. As with the passenger pigeon, contact with European settlers during the 17th century spelled doom for this monk seal. They were hunted for their oils and also because they were competition for fishermen. One of the problems was they just weren't scared of humans at all. They never tried to run because they never had a reason to throughout the course of their evolution. Now all of these factors led to the point where the last one was spotted in 1952 and scientists think they were totally extinct by 1960. Seven years later, the animal was placed on the endangered species list. Um, yeah, I think you're a little bit too late for that. Coming in at number 8 now, we have the Pyrenean Ibex, otherwise known as the Bacardo. Now these wild goats were once common among most of Spain and Portugal for thousands and thousands of years. At one point there was thought to be about 50,000 of these majestic big horn creatures roaming around the hills and mountains there. Eventually though, after hundreds of years of being hunted and having to compete with domestic animals, the Pyrenean Ibex numbers began to dwindle. Conservation efforts made by the Spanish government were too little too late. A management plan wasn't even made until 1993 when just 10 of the animals remained. Celia, the last wild Pyrenean ibex was found dead on January the 6th 2000 after she had been killed by a falling tree. The species was declared extinct. Now scientists did manage to clone a female ibex in 2009 but it only lived for a few minutes. Ok moving on now to our number 7, we've got the Tasmanian tiger. Now despite looking like a cross between a tiger and a dog, this animal is not closely related to either of them. It actually belong 
to the marsupial family, the one that includes the kangaroo, and like them, it carried its young in a pouch. There are actually cave paintings in Australia going back thousands of years ago with pictures of the Tasmanian tiger on the walls there, which I think is fascinating. But despite their presence there, their numbers slowly dwindled until they could only be found on the island of Tasmania. They started off being quite a rare sight there, but they soon began to hunt farmers' sheep, and the government then started offering rewards for every Tasmanian tiger that was killed. This relentless bounty hunting, along with the loss of habitat and new diseases that were introduced, meant that in 1933, the last confirmed Tasmanian tiger was captured and put in a zoo, where it lived for three years before dying from neglect. That's ugh. Awful. Now, there have been a couple of reports out there of wild ones that have been seen, uh, but until an official sighting is actually confirmed, it does look like this incredible creature is gone for good. That one's actually so sad. They were such a cool looking animal. Alright guys, there are thought to be almost 5,000 different species of frog in the world right now, but we've got one that recently went extinct. And number six, it's the gastric brooding frog. These little guys are, or rather were, incredible. They lived in small areas in northeast Australia and were never found more than a few meters from a river. The females would actually swallow their own fertilized eggs because they could grow and survive in their stomach because the mother had the ability to switch off her stomach acid to stop herself from digesting the eggs. This fascinated scientists who wanted to study them and learn this whole trick for humans who had stomach ulcers. But somewhere along the line it seems these little frogs were hit by a devastating disease that could completely wiped them out. In fact, the last known sighting of them was in 1981, and despite scientists looking for them ever since then, they've been unsuccessful, and the gastric brooding frog has been declared extinct. Okay, halfway through now, hopefully this is all a bit more educational than it is depressing. I know it's quite sad, but our number five now is the Eskimo curlew. Now, these long-beaked birds used to be seen flying in massive flocks from Alaska and Canada way down to Argentina and back again. There used to be millions of them that could be seen across North and South America, but with every migration they made, their numbers kept shrinking due to hunting and destroyed habitats. Hunting these birds was banned though in 1916, but after 1939, there were no more sightings of them in South America at all, and the last official sighting in North America happened in 1962. There have been a few unconfirmed reports of them in the years since then, but many experts are saying, don't hold your breath at all, because the chances are there are now no more Eskimo curlews. And for our number four now, we have the Baiji dolphin. Now, unlike its oceanic cousin, this animal could only be found in Asia's longest river, the Yangtze River. This unique dolphin first appeared in the fossil records about 25 million years ago. There, they survived for millions and millions of years, using echolocation to hunt for fish. Local fishermen even called the Baiji the goddess of protection, but it was a familiar story when humans began to disrupt its habitat. These days, an estimated 12% of the entire human population lives just along this river. Over the past 50 years, China's growth has meant more fishing, more ships, more pollution, and more dolphin hunting. In the 1950s, there were thought to be about 6,000 Baiji dolphins. By 1998, scientists could only find seven. In 2006, they looked again and found none at all, eventually declaring them to be extinct. Next up at number three, we have the Pinta Island tortoise. Now, on the Galapagos Islands, there are many, many different species of giant tortoises. Each one is unique to each one of the islands. One of them was the Pinta Island tortoise. Thanks to tortoise hunting and the introduction of feral goats, which destroyed the island's vegetation, the Pinta Island tortoises were thought to be completely wiped out by the mid 20th century. Then, on November the 1st, 1971, a scientist spotted Lonesome George, the last surviving member of his species. Scientists kept looking, but it really looked like he was actually the last of his kind. They tried mating him with a closely related subspecies, but all the eggs were sterile. Lonesome George died on June 24th, 2012, at the grand old age of, well, nobody's really quite sure, but some people say he was a hundred. Scientists are still on the lookout for another Pinta Island tortoise, but it's looking increasingly likely that George was the very last one. 
Okay, coming in at number two now, we have the Eastern Cougar. Now these days, if you are lucky enough in your life to see a Cougar in North America, it's probably not going to be the Eastern Cougar variety. They once roamed large parts of Northeastern America up into Canada and hunted white-tailed deer. As American settlements grew in the 1800s, they came into contact with the Eastern Cougar and a fight to the death began. You get no prizes for guessing who won that one. The Eastern Cougars struggled on for about another 100 years years. One was spotted and killed in Canada in 1932 and then another in Maine in 1938 and then nothing. They were added to the endangered list in 1973 and then in 2011, 73 years after their last sighting, the Eastern Cougar was officially declared extinct. And finally at number one, we have the Western Black Rhino. Now these majestic animals were cousins of the white rhino that you guys might recognize, but they'd always struggle to survive compared to them. It's thought that from 1965 to 1995, about 98% of black rhinos were killed by poachers. They wanted the black rhino horns to sell to Chinese medicine dealers who claim that the horns can cure pretty much every illness under the sun. Spoiler alert, they can't. Now, despite conservationists trying to tell people this, the demand for black rhino horns stayed high, so poachers kept poaching. In 1900, there were thought to be one million of these rhinos. By 1997, guess how many were left? 10. The last one was actually spotted in 2001, and after 10 years of no sightings, the western black rhino was declared extinct in 2011. Number 10, the dodo. In the words of my roommate, dodo. Classic. Perhaps one of the most infamous extinctions known to man was that of the dodo bird. When humans met the dodo bird, they were literally eaten to death within 80 years, I think, of their discovery. They were easy to catch, and as their name suggests, they weren't they weren't the smartest. But guys, there are some really exciting things happening in the world of genetics and finally, scientists are on the way to bringing them back. After collecting various DNA samples in January 2016, the University of California announced they have completed the genome sequence of the dodo bird, opening a variety of doors. With this new information, scientists may be able to recover enough DNA to create a clone to implant in the eggs of the closely related modern pigeon. Number nine, the thylacine. The story of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger is very sad. His name was Benjamin, and after thousands of his species were eradicated for fear that they'd eat Australia's cattle, he was the last one left. He was a resident in the Bomera Sioux in Hobart for a while, until one night, out of neglect, they didn't let him back into the kennel. He died of exposure, and his body was thrown into a dump. So sad. But Michael Archer believes we owe it to Benjamin to bring him back. There is one surviving sample of the thylacine that was pickled, pickled in alcohol. Unfortunately, some of the samples were contaminated by careless human DNA, so people reaching in going, ooh, look, it's so weird, and then dropping it back in. But the teeth contained viable samples. In fact, they were able to splice the thylacine cells successfully with a mouse. Archer even argues that should we be able to bring them back, that they could thrive in the Tasmanian ecosystem still as not much has changed. As we will discover on this list, there's a lot we can do now when it comes to cloning, so it is only a matter of time before we see them again. Number eight, aurochs. You you may have never heard of aurochs, but they are one of the most important creatures to have ever walked this earth. They are the great great grandparents of all living cattle today, so I guess you better thank them for the burger you're barbecuing. Aurochs used to roam all across Europe and were responsible for managing biodiversity through grazing. However, this species was hunted to extinction in 1627, but its DNA still lives on. The Tauros program aims to bring back the aurochs as a functional wild animal by backbreeding its closest relatives. It may not be exactly the same, but they hope to genetically breed this cattle to the point that it resembles as closely as possible the original aurochs, kind of like a modern day equivalent. Number seven, the ground sloth. Somebody warn Kristen Bell because I don't know if she will actually be able to handle this. The ground sloth was a massive version of the sloths we know now that existed around 8,000 years ago. Imagine a sloth combined with a giant bear. <laughs> So nice. They make the de-extinction list only because we do have DNA samples that have been extracted from a preserved strand of hair. So it could be done. The biggest problem preventing this, however, is the fact that no surviving relatives are large enough to give birth to it. But what scientists may be able to do is grow one in an artificial womb, which scientists in the Netherlands say they are within 10 years of perfecting. 
Number six, the Stellar Sea Cow. When I say sea cow, you might imagine the slow and lovable manatee, and you're not entirely wrong. They kind of look like a cross between a manatee and a sea lion. The Stellar Sea Cow is an extinct Cyrenian marine mammal, which is in the same order as the manatee. It used to live in the North Pacific Ocean during the Pleistocene and Holocene Epoch and was last discovered in 1741 by the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition, but disappeared by the end of the 18th century. Scientists estimate that climate changes as well as Paleolithic human hunting may have been the reason the numbers were already so low even before Europeans made the last strike. Like some others on this list, however, scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we may see these creatures again one day. Number five, elephant shrew. It may surprise you to know that though a lot of big awful things might have happened, some good did come out of 2020. The elephant shrew is just one tiny but apparently mighty example. For just over 50 years, not a single elephant shrew had been spotted, which led scientists to believe that sadly this little long-nosed mouse was a lost species. Since the 1970s, any information derived from the species was found through examinations of historic specimens. But in August 2020, a team of researchers and academics reported the opposite, that they were indeed alive and apparently well. Somehow, these little creatures were able to rebuild their numbers and are now thriving across the Horn of Africa once again. Number four, the woolly mammoth. Since the film Ice Age came out, I'm sure a lot of us can't picture the animal without imagining like Ray Romano's voice along with it because that's what we do. But eventually we may not have to use only our imaginations to see real life woolly mammoths. Mammoths preserved in the permafrost in Siberia have given paleogeneticists enough data that they have been able to sequence the woolly mammoth genome, which we already know is super important. With this data, they may be able to clone the creature or edit the genetic material to its closest living relative, the Asian elephant. But it gets even cooler than that. In 2019, scientists from Japan and Russia announced a significant step towards this goal. They were able able to bring cells of the woolly mammoth back to life. They were able to recover cells from the hind leg of a juvenile mammoth they found in Siberia that was uncovered in 2011. They successfully implanted 28,000 year old cell nuclei into mouse cells. So though we may be very far off from actually seeing a mammoth, the kind of technology that's being developed here is astounding. Like it's so cool. Scientists hope that they can use this technology to help prevent whole species from disappearing forever. Bringing back the woolly mammoth has a lot of scientific and ethical boundaries that need to be addressed. For instance, there's social creatures you'd need to bring back a whole herd. How would you introduce them back into the wild? Yada, yada, yada. But how cool is it that extinction in the future may rarely happen again if we can master this technology? Number three, the gastric brooding frog. The cooler name of this amphibian is the Rio Batracus, which were a kind of ground dwelling frog native to Queensland, Australia. It was one of two known frog species that was capable okay, of incubating their offspring within their stomach of the mother. She would swallow her own eggs, her stomach would stop making hydrochloric acid to avoid digestion and transform her stomach into a womb essentially. When the Anywhere from 20 to 25 tadpoles hatched, the mucus from their gills kept the acid at bay, which was super exciting for scientists because then they could figure out how to do that in humans if they were able to study them. But unfortunately, these frogs disappeared almost as soon as they were discovered. Unfortunately, both species of this weird and wonderful genus became extinct around the mid 1980s, but, but the scientists, a part of the appropriately named Lazarus Project, planned to bring it back to life. Previous cell samples of the species collected prior to the 1970s have been preserved for 40 years in a conventional freezer. In 2013, Professor Mike Archer and his colleagues announced they were able to successfully grow early stage cloned embryos containing DNA from the gastric brooding frog. Though it's taking longer than a couple years, the Lazarus Project is still on track to bring this unique creature back to life. But it's also important to know that frogs across the world are dying from the deadly chytrid fungus, and this technology could save them all. Number two, the quagga. So they actually have brought this back, kind of. The quagga was a type of zebra that used to roam South Africa in herds before European settlers killed them all. But now scientists in Cape Town figured out how to bring them back. Quaggas had stripes very similar to zebras, but they only appeared on the front half of their bodies and are brown along the rear. Eric Harley, the project's leader, discovered that the key to bringing back this animal was through genetics, of course, as we, we know now. By testing quagga skins, they discovered that they were actually a subspecies of the zebras we know and love. Therefore, it could be possible to manifest the genes through selective breeding and 
they were right. They are now in the fifth generation of the breeding process and already there are less and less stripes and the appearance of a brown color. The next step would be to see if they can exact the pattern and behavioral differences between the quagga and zebras, not just the coloring. So they still got a long way to go, but really cool. Number one, the Pyrian ebex. So technically, this is the only species to ever go extinct twice. The Pyrian ebex or Bicardo became extinct back in 2000 when a fallen tree fell on the last female Celia. Sad way to go. But scientists were quick to freeze some of the cells in liquid nitrogen. With these cells, they were able to clone a calf in 2003 that was brought to life for only a few minutes before it died. Despite the loss, it was a historic event in history and the first de-extinction. Now they still plan to use the 14 year old cells of Celia, but first they must see if they are still alive. In addition to this, they are also attempting to clone embryos and implant them in female goats. So they did it once. Who is to say they won't be able to do it again, but maybe, maybe with bigger prey. Mm -hmm.